Now that the presidential primaries are over and the candidates are set, Democrats have identified the new strategy that is going to help them overcome Joe Biden's sinking poll numbers against President Trump in all the states that matter. Here is liberal journalist Kara Swisher explaining the strategy on CNN. If he's going to be shameless, which is his greatest asset, the shamelessness of him, is then then Biden has to get in there very hard and go rapist, racist, fascist over and over and over again. And then the trials are happening at the same time. He's just had to pay. He's just ninety three million dollars poor right now and just hammer it in with those three things. Rapist, uh, racist, fascist. Wow. What an idea. If Democrats want to beat Trump, they should just do the same exact thing they've been doing for nine years now. That should sway the voters who are moderate and independent, wouldn't you say? Rapist, racist, fascist. After all, the Democrats won on that message in 2020 after they locked the country down and changed all the election rules to favor them. Though, perhaps we should remember, they lost on this exact message in 2016. So maybe those different election results had more to do with the things that changed between the two elections, all the rules, for instance, rather than this message, which hasn't changed at all since the moment Trump walked down that golden escalator. Rapist, racist, fascist, no! Now, if the message doesn't seem to have worked, why would the Democrats run on it? There's one simple reason. Nine years into Trump's presidential campaigns and three years into their own presidential administration, the Democrats still have not managed to find a more effective message than that one. That one might not have worked, but it's still all they got. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. A woman has gone viral by explaining how she got a date with a man she saw at the grocery store by by figuring out his name from his credit card and then looking him up on the internet and then finding his mother, figuring out which book club she's a member of, joining the book club, starting a conversation with the mother and having the mother introduce her to the son. I have a lot of thoughts on this woman, and we will get to that in just a little bit. First, though, baby, let's go. Get your Smells and Bells candle here at dailywire.com slash shop. It is, we've sold, I think, a bazillion of these candles. It's a a Lenten-themed candle, smells and bells, you know, if you want your house to smell like a 12th century monastery. I really like it. It's my favorite one yet. We also have, obviously, the pumpkin spice candle and the creme de la creme candle. I'm really into combustibles here. Obviously, you know, we have the Mayflower cigars right here, back in stock, and uh, then we have the smells and bells candle. So get it before they're gone. A huge new presidential ad has just dropped. We're we're now in the general election, even though technically, I guess the primaries are still going on, but it's over. All the candidates are out on the Republican side. There never were any serious candidates other than Biden on the Democrat side, but they're, they're out too. So it's on. The general election is on. And the big new ad that just dropped from an independent expenditure group focuses on something that Joe Biden totally whiffed at the State of the Union. It's a major political scandal that is a representation of probably the biggest political scandal for Biden, which is that he's invited an invasion across our southern border. This is a general election ad about Lake and Riley. Lake and Riley should have been able to go on a run in broad daylight without being murdered by an illegal immigrant. But Joe Biden promised not to deport illegal immigrants. Should that person be deported? That person should not be the focus of deportation. Biden vowed not to detain illegal immigrants who cross the border. No one, no one would be put in jail while waiting for their hearing. So when Jose Ibarra crossed into America illegally, he was not deported. He was not put in jail. Biden also supported sanctuary cities. Should undocumented immigrants arrested by local police be turned over to immigration officials? No. So when Jose Ibarra was arrested in New York City for endangering a child, he was freed a second time. Ibarra went to Georgia, where he beat Lake and Riley to death. How many more killers has Biden set free? Building America's teachers responsible for the content of this advertising. This is a good ad. 
The, the first thing I thought of when I saw this ad was one of the most famous ads in American presidential history. That is the Willie Horton ad. So when, when George Bush was running against Dukakis in 1988, this is after two terms of Reagan, then Vice President Bush is running against Mike Dukakis. Uh, the most famous ad of that campaign, really probably in the top five most famous ads of any presidential campaign, focused on a, a criminal that Dukakis led out of prison. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime absolutely brutal ad. George Bush got a lot of flack, of course, because all the Democrats said, this is racist. And it's racist because the murderer who Dukakis let out of prison so he could go on to murder more people and rape more people, he happens to be black. So it's obviously racist for you to mention that. Uh, but that, that was always a, a very shallow attack on Bush because Al Gore, running in the 1988 presidential primary, brought up Willie Horton, brought up the, the uh, weekend prison passes in his debates against Dukakis. So it was, it was a live issue. And, and the Bush campaign really nailed the messaging on it to, to convey this uh, public policy matter uh, in vivid detail, in, in really gripping terms to the public. It's it's unclear how much the that ad affected the race. It's it's one of the most memorable parts of the race, but it's very difficult to quantify how much one presidential TV ad can actually affect the outcome of a race. But obviously Bush won and Dukakis lost. My only take on this Lake and Riley ad and the many other Lake and Riley ads that will probably come after this, they are much more likely to affect this race than even the Willie Horton ad affected the Bush Dukakis race. Because back in 1988, the ads had to run on TV. They would only run in certain media markets. They would run for a relatively short period of time in the case of the Willie Horton ad. In 2024, there really is no such thing as a local media market anymore because we have the internet. So these ads just, they go as far as... People on the internet want them to go. They can be viral. They can run forever. They can live forever. The reason that we can even see the Willie Horton ad today is because of the internet. So this issue where, while crime was a big issue in the late 80s and early 90s, the immigration issue is a major, maybe the major issue in the United States and facing the West today. And we're now in a moment of, of, of greatest crisis when it comes to the southern border. We've never seen invasion numbers like this ever in our history. Uh, if, if Biden thinks he is going to sidestep this issue by, you know, finally answering Marjorie Taylor Greene at the State of the Union and mispronouncing Lake and Riley's name and then trying to brush it off on TV when the, the liberal journalists get angry at him, not for mispronouncing the victim's name, but for referring to the illegal alien alleged murderer as an illegal alien. Oh, can you imagine the offense against the alleged murderers? Uh, he, he's very mistaken if he thinks that he can just kind of push this aside. This has been the issue since the first Trump election and the Brexit and the Orban elections in Hungary and Georgia Maloney and uh, right-wing elections in Poland and throughout Europe, okay? This is the issue. It's only getting hotter. Biden ignores that at his peril, which is fine by me. His peril in politics is fine by me. Speaking of Trump and media attention, this is a story I meant to get to yesterday, but I, I don't want to let it go. J the Oscars took place, I guess, I didn't, I didn't watch a second of it, didn't watch virtually any of the movies that were even up for the Oscars this year or so, D didn't really pay attention at all. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel was the host, and during the Oscars, one person who did watch was President Trump, and he attacked Jimmy Kimmel from Truth Social, and, and this irked Jimmy Kimmel so much that he brought it up on stage live at the Oscars. I was told we have like an extra minute, and um, I'm really proud of something. Uh, I, I was wondering if I could share it with you. I just got a, a review, and um, <laughs> has there ever been a worse host than Jimmy Kimmel at the Oscars? 
His opening was that of a less than average person trying too hard to be something which he is not and never can be. <laughs> Get rid of Kimmel and perhaps replace him with another washed up but cheap ABC talent, George Sloppinopoulos. <laughs> he would make everybody on stage look bigger, stronger, and more glamorous. Blah, blah, blah. Make America great again. <laughs> See if you can guess which former <laughs> president just posted that on Truth. Anyone? No? Well, thank you, President Trump. Um, thank you for watching. I'm surprised you're still... Isn't it past your jail time? It's a, it's a decent... It, Jimmy's rejoinder is not nearly as funny as the original post, which which Trump trolls Jimmy into reading on stage at the Oscars. But it's still pretty funny, and they have this funny banter, and everyone's laughing in the audience. I bring it up to say, this is star power. This is a genuine advantage that Trump has over every other Republican president of my lifetime other than Ronald Reagan, who also had a lot of star power. The, Donald Trump, through sheer tyranny of will and humor is able to get the host of the Oscars, who hates him, to read his very funny and endearing and charming tweet on stage at the Oscars, prompting the, the audience to laugh at the tweet. Don't forget, the audience started laughing before Jimmy Kimmel insulted Trump, before he got his bar back at Trump. They were just laughing at the tweet because the tweet is very funny. No other Republican in my lifetime really can do that. It's just so funny. And one of the chief advantages is, of humor is that it brings the temperature down. So the libs are going to tell you with a straight face, this man, he's a rapist, racist, fascist, he's Hitler, he's this, but they, do, they obviously don't believe it because they're all laughing at the funny thing that he said. It's, if anything, what, what they're really conveying is they think he's just like a little bombastic and silly. Not that he's Hitler. They're not, <laughs> at, at the Oscars in, you know, 1941, no one's laughing at the Hitler tweet, okay? No one, if they really believed that he's, well, they call him a Nazi. They call him Hitler. If they really believed this, they wouldn't be giggling at the tweets. That is star power. That is commanding a room. That is lowering the temperature to the point that now we're all just kind of telling jokes, and all of a sudden, it's a, it's a Friars Club roast. All of a sudden, we're all doing a, a Don Rickles routine. And when you take that away, you've, you've now robbed the Democrats of those three attacks that Kara Swisher saying, Biden needs to be yelling till he's blue in the face, racist, rapist, fascist. Oh, I don't know. I mean, he, Trump is so charming that he was able to, from probably... 3,000 miles away, was able to do a comedy routine at the Oscars in front of the people who were supposed to hate him most, and they laugh at the jokes. And they laugh at the jokes. That is a political skill. I don't care if you love Trump. I don't care if you absolutely detest Trump. And even if you're a Republican who detests Trump, that every Republican should do his darndest to learn that skill. It's very difficult to learn that kind of a skill, but very, very helpful. Now, when you want to learn things, you ought to check out Hillsdale College. Go to hillsdale.edu slash Knowles. Are you a few years, maybe you're a few decades out of school and wondering, what the heck did I even learn? And what was the point? You might even be thinking, I don't have the time to learn something new. If that's you, you're not alone and it's not too late. Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses. Learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic, or the History of the Ancient Church with Hillsdale College's online courses. If you are not sure where to start, check out C.S. Lewis on Christianity. In this seven-lecture course, you will examine some of Lewis's classic works, including Mere Christianity, The Screwtape Letters, and The Abolition of Man. You will also see what Lewis had to say about Scripture, prayer, suffering, joy, heaven, and hell. The course is self-paced so that you can start whenever and wherever. Enroll now in C.S. Lewis on Christianity to discover Lewis's core lessons on Christianity and how to apply faith to your life. Go to hillsdale.edu slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, to enroll. There's no cost. It's easy to get started. Hillsdale.edu slash Knowles to enroll. Hillsdale.edu slash Knowles. Speaking of stage appearances, 
I'm going to be at University of Wisconsin-Madison tomorrow. I think I'm going to be there. I'm not totally positive. I think some tickets might still, I don't know if tickets are still available. Go to yaf.org or you just Google Michael Knowles, UW-Madison. Uh, as of yesterday, there were some tickets available because there was a lot of confusion as to whether or not I would even be allowed to go to the school. I had a great honor last year. I was uh, voted by FIRE, you know, the, the Individual Rights and Education Organization. I was voted the most canceled speaker of 2023. They compiled a database of all of, and they, by the way, they didn't even include all of the cancellation attempts. And I, I was the most disinvited, the most canceled speaker of uh, 2023. So it's only March of this year. I think we're already off to a good start. UW-Madison had invited me. We signed the contract. We're ready to go. It's, Students were selling, the, not selling the tickets, giving away the tickets because these the university events we don't charge for. And then at the very last minute, UW-Madison's administration, probably under severe pressure from the left, which has been threatening protests from the beginning, uh, tried to slap on a $4,000 plus security fee. Now, this was very strange. Other schools have done this. This is one of the tricks that the liberal schools use to get the conservatives disinvited. And we know that UW-Madison is a very liberal campus. We didn't expect it because my friends and colleagues, Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, a number of other conservatives, but even Ben and Matt have spoken at UW-Madison, even relatively recently. No security fee, no problem. The administration, just little old me. I consider myself very nice, very amiable, but little old me, they decide to slap this $4,000 security fee. The students aren't going to pay that. So when, you, when the administration levies the security fee, it is to say, oh, whoopsie daisy, sorry, you can't come anymore. And we're only going to levy it on this speaker who we particularly don't like, not the other speakers. It's a, it's a way to cancel you. So uh, fortunately, YAF sued. Uh, the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty sued. The Mountain State's Legal Foundation sued. They threatened to sue. And uh, the administration backed down. So we're good. No $4,271.17 security fee. I am, as of now, speaking at UW-Madison tomorrow. I hope to see you there. If you can make it, go reserve a ticket uh, if, if they are still available. I've been asked to speak about life, uh, why murder is wrong. Uh, you know, in in years past, we wouldn't have had to discuss such things, but our culture has really, really gotten confused recently. So we'll be talking about that. Should be a lot of fun out in Madison. Speaking of bad behavior at schools, uh, there is a, I don't know if it's a student or just some kind of crazy protester, but uh, sauntered in to Cambridge over across the pond in the motherland and destroyed a painting of Lord Arthur Balfour at Cambridge. Uh, this person did so in the name of Palestine Action. And this person shows up, starts spray painting. You can see in this video that went viral, spray painting all over this beautiful old oil portrait of, of Lord Balfour. Then pulls out a knife or a box cutter and slices up the, the painting. So just totally destroys this painting. I, I don't really care what one's position is on the Israel-Palestine conflict. It's a long-standing, very complicated conflict. That sort of barbarian should not only not be allowed into Cambridge, that sort of barbarian should not be allowed into the United Kingdom or into the civilized world. That is the end of culture, okay? Okay. Certainly that person should never be allowed near any work of art. That person should not be permitted in civilized society. Obviously, I don't know, I haven't seen any follow-up reports of, of what would happen to that person. I hope the person would be locked up for many, many years, decades, one hopes. Uh, but furthermore, you see this not only with the Israel-Palestine conflict, you see this with the climate wackos who go in and they throw soup on priceless art. And fortunately, uh, the civilized people have have realized the threat from the barbarians at the gates. And so they put the, the priceless art behind glass. So generally the art is preserved. But this is, this is the end of culture, truly. Because there's no limit to uh, supposedly righteous causes. Again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that Palestine liberation or, you know, protecting us all from the evil sun monster who's going to kill us. I'm not suggesting those are necessarily the most righteous causes in the world. But, but, even if they were, there's no limit to this. And so if one can, can uh, convince oneself 
to do almost anything, any barbaric act of, of cultural destruction in the name of some cause. And at, at the end of that, the common good is just destroyed. The, the, the public life, you know, the culture, the art, everything that we all kind of do together that beautifies our world, it's all gone. All totally gone. And in part, I don't want to blame the victim here, but uh, Cambridge and Oxford and Harvard and Yale and all the universities bear a little of, of the blame here, at least the, the education system broadly. People used to be raised in a, in a more right manner. They, w- they learned that there's a difference between good and bad. There are just, there are just ways to behave. There are things that one does and one does not do. And that, that's gone out the window now as we make a mockery of the moral order, as we make a mockery of things like uh, respect for our elders, not just our immediate parents, but our forebears, respect for our country, fili- which is an extension of filial piety, a, a respect for hierarchy and order, uh, humility. All of these traditional virtues have been denied in modern life. And so we become animals and, and barbarians like this, this pro-Palestine protest or whatever. Uh, that, 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 that is just an acid that will, will eventually just wash away all of culture if it hasn't done so already. It's not just, you can't just blame the Brits. You can't just even blame the pro-Palestine people. We tear down statues all the time in our own country as well. We tear down art and, and history all the time in our own country as well. Now it's finally visiting the educational institutions again, which lie at the heart of much of the problem. Now, turning from art and culture and beauty toward commerce, you got to check out Ramp. Go to ramp.com slash Knowles. When you're running a business, time is money, baby, and money is honey, and that ain't funny. That's why I'm so excited to have Ramp as a new sponsor of this show. If you are a finance professional looking for a better way to maximize productivity and cut wasteful spending, then Ramp could be for you. Ramp is the corporate card and spend management software designed to help you save time and put money back in your pocket. With Ramp, you can issue cards to every employee with limits and restrictions, automate expense reporting, and stop wasting time at the end of every month. Ramp's accounting software automatically collects receipts and categorizes your expenses in real time so you don't have to. You will never have to chase down a receipt again. Your employees will no longer spend hours submitting expense reports. The time that you will save each month on employee expenses will allow you to close your books eight times faster. Ramp is easy to use whether you got five employees or 5,000. You can get started in less than 15 minutes. Get $250 when you join Ramp. Go to ramp.com slash Knowles. That is spelled R-A-M-P dot com slash Canada W-L-E-S. Ramp dot com slash Knowles. Cards issued by Sutton Bank and Celtic Bank members FDIC. Terms and conditions apply. Speaking of teaching young people, Yuval Harari, who has become something of a court philosopher for the liberal establishment in the West. He's uh, often associated with the World Economic Forum because he's lauded by the, the WEF types, you know, Klaus Schwab, the globalists, the liberals. Uh, he's an Israeli writer, a very popular writer. He wrote a book called Homo Deus and Sapiens is probably his most famous one. And uh, he, uh, as far as the modern popular liberal writers go, he's probably my favorite one because he's the most honest about the liberal worldview. And he says, yeah, we don't believe in God. We don't believe in the soul. We don't believe in anything. We're going to we're gonna become God. I mean, the very phrase Homo Deus is right, man, God. The idea that we're going to be the last generation of Homo sapiens. We're going to conquer death. We're going to conquer all the foibles and failings of humanity. It's just all the fantasies that that uh, prideful, ambitious people have been pursuing f- since time immemorial, uh, this guy just articulates it in a really clear way. At a time when, in our modern culture, usually the liberals want to gussy up their plans in more uh, humanitarian and modest language, but he doesn't. He just comes right out and says it. So I, I have a, a grudging respect for him for that. Uh, so Harari goes on to one of these late night talk shows, I think it was Colbert, And he explains that now we're at a real impasse. We've got a real dilemma in education because we're just moving so quickly into the future of progress that we don't even know what to teach kids anymore because all the stuff from the past and even from the present, it's about to be irrelevant. Is it real that we're actually going through some sort of accelerating change? Uh, Every generation thinks like that, but this time it's real. (laughs) And, you know, it's the first time in human history that nobody has any idea 
how the world would look like in 20 years. Now, of course, politically, it was always impossible to predict the future. If you live in the Middle Ages, you don't know, maybe next year the Vikings invade, the Mongols invade, there is an epidemic. You can't predict that. That the basic stuff of human life, like the basic, basic skills... We're all going to be herding sheep in 20 years, no matter yeah, who's in charge. You need to teach your kids how to plant rice or wheat, how to ride a horse, how to shoot a bow, because this will still be relevant in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Today, nobody has any idea what to teach young people that will still be relevant in 20 years. My favorite part of this very unfortunate clip, because the man, the man is obviously intelligent. He's, he just strikes me as an example of someone who is so intelligent. Not just that he's so intelligent. He's intelligent and so high on his own supply. He's, he's so enamored of his... Uh, presumed wisdom, that he makes himself look foolish, very foolish. And he, he even nods at it a little bit at the beginning of, of his statement. He says, look, we have no idea what we can teach people that will even be relevant in 20 years. And I know that every generation ever has said that, but this time it's real. <laughs> oh yes, this time it's Just so happens that this time, when we are blessed to have the Yuval Hararis of the world to... to explain the future to us. This time, it's real. Every other time for millennia, it hasn't been real, but this time it's real. So what are we going to teach them? Well, I don't deny that technology will change, though uh, frankly, technology advances a little more slowly than a lot of us have predicted. Weren't we supposed to have flying cars by now? You know, wasn't that what they all predicted in the 1960s? And yet really we had no um, significant uh, technological innovation between the middle of the 20th century and, and the 1990s. I guess with computing and the internet was a major technological advancement. But before that, it was pretty much the vacuum cleaner and the dishwasher, you know, and then we kind of stagnated for a little while. Uh, you know, I, we went into space, but, you know, we went to the moon, but then we forgot how to go to the moon even. Okay, so, so much for that technological advancement. Then with the computer age, it develops. But, but even then, you know, now we're looking at AI. We're told AI is going to take over the world in five years. AI doesn't even know that the Pope isn't an Indian woman. You know, AI does, seems to be a little weak. AI hasn't quite figured out how many fingers are on our hands. So I, I'm not denying that we're living in an age of technological advancements. I think it's a little slower than these techno-futurists would like to believe. But furthermore, no matter how much technology advances, it seems to me that there will always be eternal things certain things that are always true. There's a reason that Aristotle has endured for millennia and that Aristotle's account of human nature pretty much has never been improved upon. The, the one improvement you might say would be St. Thomas Aquinas, who's writing, what, a thousand years ago almost, you know, 800 years ago. Um, and, and he, you know, kind of melds together the Platonic tradition, the Aristotelian tradition, and Christianity. Syn brings them together, synthesizes them in Christianity. But ag again, all those things I've just described are at least 2,000 years old and ha haven't really changed at all. Human nature doesn't really change at all. The facts of reality don't change at all. Now, what these guys believe, what the liberals believe, is that human nature will change. So much so that we won't even be homo sapiens anymore. We'll be homo deus. We'll be this new kind of human and there's a fear. We're ordering babies now, uh, like you go to a store. You go to a store, you order a baby, you pick out the eye color, you pick out the hair color, you pick out the sex, you pick out the mother, even though the mother's going to have nothing to do with the baby's life. You pick out the, the surrogate, which is just a poor woman somewhere, and you pay to rent her womb and then rip the baby away from the only mother he's ever known. And so we do all sorts of ghastly, seemingly futuristic things that seem to, to presume the power of God. Yes, of course we do that. We've been doing that sort of thing for a very long time, and yet human nature has never changed. Yet the fundamentals of reality have never changed. No matter how much the liberals scream until they're blue in the face that a man can be a woman or that a baby is not a baby, it remains the case that the man and the woman are separate. They are different. It remains the case that the baby is a baby, no matter how much the, the progressives want to convince us otherwise. It's very, what, what will be, what is more likely to be relevant in 20 years? The idle musings of Yuval Harari or the teachings of Aristotle and Plato and St. Thomas Aquinas and the great thinkers of the tradition who have touched on the enduring things. Which do you, which would you put your money on? My money 
is on Aristotle. No disrespect to Mr. Harari or Klaus Schwab or any of the liberals who have been believing a few too many of their own press releases. Speaking of teaching young people, Giselle Bündchen has inadvertently just uh, displayed one of the absolute worst things about divorce. We talk a lot about how awful the sexual revolution is, how crazy it is that a man thinks he can be a woman, how awful it is that we're, they're trying to in schools, even how awful it is that we kill babies or sell them on the surrogacy market. But the sexual revolution goes a little further back than that, goes a little bit deeper. And, and at the heart of the sexual revolution and all the terrible consequences is the destruction of the family, which began not when Anthony Kennedy wrote some romantic poetry from the Supreme Court and pretended that two fellows can get married, but it goes back further to the normalization and acceptance of divorce. And now we live in an age where we tell each other all sorts of lies about divorce. We say, oh, divorce, it's, it's perfectly natural. It's perfectly normal. You know, sometimes people grow apart. It's better for the kids, actually, for mommy and daddy to just split up and go date other people. And it's better. Kids are resilient. So I guess I'm actually saying it's not better for the kids, but they're resilient and they'll get over it. But also it's better for them too. So it doesn't matter that they're resilient. Anyway, forget about it. It's really good because I want to do me and I want to go date the karate instructor, says, you know, I don't know know who. So Giselle Bündchen comes out and she articulates one of the, the real dangers of divorce, which is, she says, the kids have different rules when they go to their father's house. Co-parenting, how has that been? I think it's been, you know, what I think, you know, there's easier days than other, but I think, you know, it's, it's amazing that the kids, they, they're super smart children. (laughs) They know what they can get away with. So I think it's natural that it has different rules and then kids just adapt and they're going to try to do what they want. And I can only control what I do. And I think for me, now is really about the balance. Now we have, you know, Tom has time with them and I have time with them, which I think is amazing because they get to, you know, really experience, you know, again, more enriching for their lives, two different worlds. And they get to learn from two different worlds. and, And that's wonderful for them, I think. They're living in two different worlds because you blew up their actual world. When we use this phrase around the Daily Wire, I think Drew mentioned it first, but we all use this phrase because it's so apt. We say that divorce blows up a kid's whole world. And Giselle Bündchen is admitting this. She's saying, yeah, we blew it up, and now there's two different worlds. This is one world cracked in half. Now the kids live in these two different worlds, and which means that they don't have two homes. They have no home. They're at home nowhere because their parents, who are the core of their world, have split up. And so one expression of their total lack of home is they don't even have a consistent set of rules, naturally, because they don't have a consistent uh, family, because they don't have a consistent head of household, because they don't have a consistent anything. So they, they develop a kind of a schizophrenia where it, when they're at mommy's house, They know they can get away with something. Oh, they're clever. They're so adaptable. It's all just the same way of saying kids are resilient, which is just a way for adults to uh, justify or rationalize harming children. Say, oh, don't worry about it. Kids are resilient. And so they say they can get away with this here and then get away with that there. But they have no consistent sense of what the rules are, where the rules come from. Where do rules come from? Where do laws come from? I mean, this has such direct political consequences because we no longer even know what the law is. What the libs will tell you is law is just uh, kind of whatever we decide, whatever we want. It's an expression of preference. And it's subjective and it's relative and it's just kind of whatever we want, man. It's not based on anything rational or objective or real or solid. That is a consequence and and an expression of a world of divorce where there's no solidity. There's nothing grounded. What law actually is, is an ordinance of reason uh, by him, for, for the common good, by him who has care of the community and promulgated. There is a connection between the civil laws, the domestic laws, you know, the rules of the house, and the natural law and the enduring moral order. And who is to enforce these laws? Well, mommy and daddy enforce these laws. And there is there's even an order to the household. Traditionally speaking, it would be daddy who's the head of the household. And daddy and mommy become one flesh and are married. 
And when you explode that, you explode a lot more than just, you know, going on vacation with mommy and daddy together. You explode a lot more than just the one house you're living in. You explode the entire sense of how one behaves, how society is ordered, whether or not there is objective, solid reality, whether or not reason can be applied to human behavior. When, when you exalt mere passion or, or uh, un, irrational interest, when you exalt that and you say, well, I'm going to do me, you know, in my 40s, man, I'm just, it, this is me time, you know, and I'm going to do whatever I want. When you do that, you scandalize Everyone, you scandalize your children directly. It's a stumbling block in their education. And you scandalize the public broadly because the marriage, the family, is the fundamental building block of society. You know, the iconic, many people are calling it iconic, leftist tears tumbler, it's back. Everybody wants one, but there's only one way to get it. And that's by becoming a Daily Wire Plus annual member. Not only does your annual membership give you unparalleled access to ad-free, uncensored shows from your Daily Wire hosts, on-demand hit movies, series, and groundbreaking documentaries. But now that membership also includes our Leftist Tears Tumblr. Soccer moms have their Stanleys, but you, you are raising the bar with the iconic, have I said it's iconic, Leftist Tears Tumblr. New Daily Wire Plus Insider annual members get a free Tumblr, or you can put your money where your values are and join us on the front line in the fight to shape the culture with an all-access membership, and then you get two Leftist Tears Tumblers for free. Join now, get your free Leftist Tears Tumbler at dailywireplus.com. My favorite comment yesterday is from Jaden Boxall, who says, I'm not far right. I'm just right so far. Oh, 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 baby. That's good. I'd actually never heard that, and I'm going to steal it. Mine, that's my line now. I'm going to use that. It's really good. I'm not far right. I'm just right so far. Speaking of norms of behavior, a woman has gone viral for describing to TikTok how she got a date with a man. Take it away. I saw this really cute guy at the grocery store the other day. So naturally, I followed him to the checkout counter. And when he gave the cashier his credit card, I peeped it to see what his name was. And then I Googled him and found his social media profiles. And I was able to tell that he was single. So I went through his friends list and I found his mother's page. And then I looked through his mother's page and I saw that she was a member of this book club that's in my area. So I sent a request to join the book club. So I went to the book club meeting and I met his mom there and we bonded over some books that we both liked. And she just thought I was so nice. And I brought it up randomly in conversation that I was single. And she let me know that she had a son that was single also that lived in the area. And maybe it would be cool for us to get together and chat sometime. So I gave her my number, which she gave to her son. And this morning he texted me and asked if I'd like to get together this weekend and do something. So I guess we're gonna go on a date. <laughs> I'm really excited. <laughs> I, I love this bit. Something that I think most people on the internet missed is this is obviously just a bit. This is obviously a joke. I, this isn't real. I, I, I don't have proof of that, but I'd be willing to bet a lot of money that it's just a bit, in part because, one, it's very difficult to see someone's name on a credit card. You know, like if you're online at a grocery store, my eyes aren't that good, but I don't think you could do it really. And then, two, if you've got the date with the guy in a few hours and you're really this crazy, you wouldn't, you wouldn't post a TikTok about it before the date, would you? you would, maybe you'd tell your friends or something, but you, pr you probably wouldn't do that. So it's, it's very funny, though. And it's gone viral, and the reason that it's of public interest, I think, is because of the reaction to it. Because there's one really stupid reaction that I've seen for the people who are taking this seriously who think this woman actually did this, which is, can you imagine if a man did this? If a man behaved this way, it would be, this woman would take out a restraining order. But if a woman behaves this way, we all kind of laugh it off and say it's cute, albeit perhaps a little crazy. To which I say... Right. That's true. That's right. It's different <laughs> when men do stuff. It's different than when women do the same stuff because men and women, you see, are different. That's why. That's why. And so it's a delightful thing. There's a phrase. Please pardon my French pronunciation. Vive la différence. Which is, you know, it's great. Isn't that wonderful? Long live 
the distinction between men and women. Isn't that men are from Mars, women are from Venus? Isn't that so funny? So this, you know, if this were real, this woman's probably about fifteen percent too crazy. But a lot of guy, if a if a cute girl walks up to a guy and says, "Hey, I think you're really cute," you know, or she even kind of looks you up, whatever, finds you on Instagram or Facebook and messages, you, "Hey, you're cute. You want to get a drink?" Most guys would say, "Like, heck yeah, man, let's go. That sounds great." Whereas if it were in the reverse and some dude did this to a chick, the woman would have her guard up and say, "The guy seems kind of creepy," because that would be the case. Because men are stronger than women. And men and women have different uh, reactions to and inclinations toward the opposite sex. And yeah, that's true, man. And some people on the right, I mean, this is just a silly little video that's going around, but some people on the right, they, they take this stuff very, very seriously. I think this is one of the big problems with the, I guess you'd call it red pill movement or the men going their own way or the the, the guys who really... They, they really seem to not like women and they don't want to get married and they just, they're furious at women, you know. Uh, they seem to have the same kind of anthropology that the libs do, you know, in the sense that they hate the difference between men and women. I guess it's the difference between like a normal person, a normal guy should look at a woman. A, a liberal guy would look at a woman and say, there's no difference between a woman and a man. There's no difference whatsoever. We're all exactly the same. Men should go into the women's room. A normal guy should look at the different at men and women and say, ah, women, women. Those women, very difficult to understand those women. Ah, isn't that wonderful? And then the guys who have been really just radicalized, I don't know, they say, oh, the women, they're different. I hate that the women are different. No, I really like, if the women were not different and I were attracted to women, that would mean that I'm gay. And that's kind of, it would be kind of weird, wouldn't it? But that's what those guys sound like. They sound, ironically, just like the guys on the left. Maybe that, is that, do they call that horseshoe theory? I think so. Speaking of overzealous people, poll just came out from Rasmussen that shows that most Democrats would oppose certifying the election if President Trump were to win in 2024. I love this poll. I love, it is chef's kiss punchline of the last three years. 2021, January 6th, President Trump has ostensibly lost the election. Some Republicans are a little skeptical because, you know, the Democrats changed all the voting rules to favor them. And in some cases they did so illegally and unconstitutionally, as in the case of Pennsylvania. And then they started counting the votes and the vote count seemed to be going for Trump. And then they just paused voting overnight and they wouldn't let some uh, election watchers in in certain precincts. And then what do you know, they pick up vote counting after, you know, the middle of the night. And what do you know, Biden all of a sudden is ahead, takes days and days to count the votes. And well, in the end, Biden pulls it out. So some Republicans, a little skeptical about how that election went off, and they challenged the certification on January 6th, the worst day ever. And the, the most credible challenge to it was advanced by Senator Cruz, I thought it was very wise, which was to establish an electoral commission, which is what happened in 1877 after the contested election of 1876, uh, when there was a whole lot of chicanery in there, and they, there, there was an electoral commission that was established, and a deal was struck to determine that, that presidential election. So that's what Senator Cruz and some members of the House proposed. Democrats told us that this was insurrection. This was a, a grave threat to democracy, blah, 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 blah. Now the Democrats are saying that not if they lose the election under dubious circumstances, but if they lose the election even fair and square, they will do the very same thing that they told the Republicans was insurrection. The question was, some Democrats in Congress have said that if Trump wins this year's election, they will vote against certifying the election results because of Trump's role on January 6, 2021. Do you support or oppose Democrats refusing to certify the election if Trump wins? If Trump wins. That was the, it's not just if the Republicans steal it. It's if Trump wins. 57% of Democrats would oppose certification. Nearly two-thirds of liberals said they would oppose the certification. Ironically, they are revealing that they would be willing to cheat if Trump won fair and square. Republicans, now you might say, well, the election wasn't stolen in 2020. Okay, I'm not even taking up that question for a second. I'm, I'm just pointing out the Republicans who opposed certification of the election results believed, I think, 
quite legitimately that there were there there was illegal chicanery that went on the in the election that they were cheated and so the republicans were pursuing a legally precedented what they believed to be legal path to challenge an unfair election the democrats are saying no they're flipping it they're saying no no, no. we will cheat if trump wins a fair election it's not just that that what's good for the goose is good for the gander you know it's not just that the the democrats are doing what the republicans did they're going much much further which is always the case and so why do i mention this do I mention this to say, imagine, imagine if the shoe were on the other foot, imagine if the roles were reversed. Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't like to say that because it's a very silly thing to say. Uh, I, I mention all of this because the next time it happens, and you know the Democrats are going to do it. The next time that they say, this is unprecedented, you need to look, it's one thing to be a Republican, but this kind of man, this kind of election, this, so you can't possibly defend this. P- please remember it's not in good faith. Please remember they're being disingenuous. Please remember that whatever they are accusing you of doing, not only are you not not likely doing that, they would be willing to do 10 times what they are accusing you of doing. They, they, they are being, they are much more willing to do a far less just version of whatever it is that they are accusing you of doing. Please don't fall for it. Don't be the Liz Cheney's of the world. Don't be the Adam Kinzinger's of the world. When they tell you what they believe, what they want to do, how far they're willing to go, that they would be willing to steal an election. Hey, I wonder if perhaps they thought the same way in 2020. I wonder if they acted on it in 2022. When they tell you that, you ought to believe them. It is Tuesday. The rest of the show continues now. You do not want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, Canada WLAS to check out for two months free on all annual plans. (laughs) 